And at this time, we want to welcome all of you who are joining us online. We're so glad to have you with us this day. And um, we, uh, we have at this time, is this, am I right? This is the last? Yes, this is the last choir anthem. So I do, I do want to say thank you so much to uh, Laura um, and Joanne, who helped out playing so much to the <laughs> choir, of course, as well. Um, for, uh, for leading us in all of that. So I'll turn yeah. it over to you to introduce. He stole my words. <laughs> yes, thank you to the choir. Um, it's been a wonderful season. Our last anthem, I picked this one um, to finish up our choir season on purpose. It's called God Be With You Till We Meet Again. Just a little bit of history about this one here. Often we hear someone tell us gullibly to have a good day. Would not a far better farewell for Christians to be the loving wish of today's hymn text? God be with you. The added thought of till we meet again suggests a sincere desire for continued friendship. The writer of this hymn text, Jeremiah E. Rankin, pastored several prominent congregational churches throughout the East until 1889, when he became, a pres became president of Howard University, the noted school for the education of black students. A powerful preacher and an excellent leader and promoter of congregational singing, Rankin wrote much poetry, including the popular hymn, Tell It to Jesus. He also edited a number of well-known gospel songbooks. No other hymn text, except perhaps, Blessed Be the Tide That Binds, has been, a widely, has been as widely used as this one as a closing benediction for church services. God Be With You was a favorite in the Moody Sankey meetings throughout North and South America and England. It became the official closing song for the Christian Endeavor conventions around the world. And still today, there is no finer farewell that can be expressed by Christians to one another as they leave a place of worship than the sincere wish, God be with you till we meet again.
So we're continuing our scripture rememorizing with Deuteronomy 31.8. I don't know if you noticed, we're sort of going New Testament, Old Testament, but uh, this is a great one indeed. Hopefully you're, you're learning this if you're saying it every day and it's coming a little easier to you. So uh, we do have our blanks up on the screen, so let's see how we do. I will begin us. It is the... Keep going. Very, very good. That's, that is excellent. We'll see how you do next week with even more blanks in there, but you are doing really well, uh, really well with that. Let us say it all together. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Indeed, indeed. And now for our scripture reading. All right, is this hot? Okay, we're good. All right, so our scripture today comes from Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 22. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, it is on page 950. So here we go. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of, of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the morrow, for it was almost already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the, of the men came to about 5,000. On the morrow, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priest family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a cripple, by what means this man has been healed? Be it known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, but which has become the head of the corner. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they wondered and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man that had been healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they have commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For what a notable sign has been performed through them is manifest to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we can not but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all men praise God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This ends our reading. Did you hear how old that man was? He was old. He was more than 40. Yeah. <laughs> hey, be quiet, Steve. <laughs> so, um, one thing I used to do when I was in college, and I'm so proud of it, but yes, 
I did some drinking when I was in college, and um, I, I also belong to a group called the Arnold Air Society, and uh, the Arnold Air Society was having their national convention in Colorado. Well, I should say this, both Colorado, I believe, and Virginia, where I went to college, it was only 18 to drink uh, back then, um, way back then. And um, so we had this conference in, in uh, Colorado Springs, and of course the big thing, everybody was drinking, and I probably more than I, a little bit more than I should have, certainly, but I remember, I, I remember I needed to somebody's, I was curious, somebody's room number, and I was, and I don't even remember why. So I went up to the front desk, and the front desk had these brand new, f newfangled contraptions, I don't know if I'd ever really seen before called computers. So this is early '80s, and and they um, and and so I remember I said, "Oh, I'm looking for so and so." So they she starts punching it in and starts, you know, looking it up. And the computer screen is sort of facing her, of course. And I like lean way onto the counter because I want to see this computer screen, you know. And I'm leaning on her counter. She tells me what the room number is. I thank her. I go away. And then I think, oh, my goodness, how rude was I? That's not me. You know, that's not what I would do normally. And um, because I wasn't really in control, right? Other things were controlling me, not me. Paul writes to the Ephesians, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is not a sermon about the evils of alcohol or something like that, but it is about the Holy Spirit and how we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the first thing we have to know is this. We all have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit. In uh, John 14, right before Jesus goes to the cross, and he says, he says this, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. I know it says advocate. Think Holy Spirit. He will give you another advocate to be with you forever. In verse 18, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. Now Jesus says, I'm coming to you, but Jesus isn't going to be there. Well, his spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to be there, right? Um, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. How is Jesus with us always? Through the Holy Spirit, he's with us. So here I, I, I mentioned he'll give you another advocate. If you look at the different translations, you'll see advocate, uh, counselor, comforter, helper, all these different words. Because it's really hard. What Jesus says is hard to translate. Because what, um, what John wrote, the word John wrote, you know, see how complicated it gets. Jesus probably spoke in Aramaic. John wrote it down in a different language, Greek. We translate it into English, but John used the word parakletos, which means one who comes alongside of another to aid them. So just think, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside of you to help you out. He's with you always. And and the Holy Spirit can help you remember things. I mean, it's powerful. He can help you remember things. I remember one Ash Wednesday, like 20 minutes before I had to come up here to open up the church and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just praying for the service. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden this thought comes through my mind because I have everything ready to go. But the thought was, don't forget the book of worship. Now, it's another book that I needed for that night that I had totally forgotten to put on the stack of stuff to take. I'd just forgotten it. But it was the Holy Spirit who said, because I know I would have gotten up front there, and I would have started freaking out because I'd be like, now we, oh, wait, and I don't got, you know, and that would have been really awkward. 
But, um, but I think the Holy Spirit helped me realize that. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and brings the right person at the right place at the right time. So when Carol and I was in, were in seminary, um, and we had a friend, and this friend was doing, um, was doing vacation Bible school. He needed money to do vacation Bible school because where they were doing vacation Bible school was in the worst neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And, uh, and I admired him for going. You know, I wouldn't want to do that. But, but he was going. But he needed money. I didn't know how much. But, but Carol and I decided, yeah, we'll, we'll give him $75. Not 50 not $100. We'll, we'll give him $75. I remember, I still remember giving him the check for $75, and he looked at us sort of funny and said, you know, that's the exact amount I needed to finish paying for this trip. And that's what the Holy Spirit does, brings the right person at the right place at the right time. Um, I also think, now maybe this isn't exactly the Holy Spirit, but maybe it is, I don't know. I also think the Holy Spirit can save your life. You know, I was watching the news this past week, and I don't know, there was a, I think there was an apartment fire in Lancaster County somewhere. I think it was in Lancaster County. And they were interviewing a couple of the people who were there, and they were interviewed this guy who was there who was saying, you know, I should be dead because I, I would fall asleep. I was sleeping when the fire broke out. And then what he said was, and I thought this was cool. I mean, he said this on the news. He said, and then somebody tapped me on my shoulder twice and woke me up. And I saw the fire and I got out of there. The only thing is, I was all alone. There's nobody else there. And then what he said was, I think it was an angel. Well, maybe. Holy Spirit, maybe. I don't know. But I do believe that. I do believe the Holy Spirit can save your life. And when we have these things that are just, wow, that's a coincidence or that's a coincidence, and sometimes they're really strong coincidences, I think that might be the Holy Spirit. When we have these ideas that just sort of come out of the blue, we're not even thinking that, and all of a sudden, pay attention, that may be the Holy Spirit. Okay. So the Holy Spirit helps us to live. However, we can... Learn not to listen to the Holy Spirit at your own peril, right? Um, I think about, you know, David and Bathsheba. We, we know the, the story, and the quickest story is David had an affair, committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then when she turns up pregnant, he murders, has her husband murdered, in essence, to get him out of the way. I mean, that's bad stuff. And this is King David who is said to be a man after God's own heart. And I'm sure somewhere in that whole process, because this is what the Holy Spirit does, the Holy Spirit spoke to David and said, ah, yeah, don't do that. But for David, all of a sudden Bathsheba was more important than anything else. Having her was too much. And he didn't listen and I think, um, I mean, perhaps you've had that experience as well where you're thinking of doing something, you know, it's probably not right, or saying something, you know, it's probably not right. Or the opposite, you're thinking of not doing something you think you're supposed to do. And this voice tells you, uh, be careful here. Be careful. And then we have a choice. And how many times do we say, I'm going to do it anyways? We do that. We do that. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. If we're not careful, we can learn not to listen to the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit with us. However, at times, something happens. And the Holy Spirit is there in a more powerful way. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit at different times. You know, in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, um, 
we, it, it talks about, we didn't read that scripture today for a couple reasons. One is we're really familiar with it, and also because it has a lot of hard names in it. So, uh, so but it says that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what we think. I mean, Acts 2, the birthday of the church, they're filled, and then they were, had the Holy Spirit. Except we see something interesting in Acts 4. In Acts 4, and we, we did hear this story. So Peter and John heal this man who's crippled, right? And, and then when, they, when he heals them, it draws a crowd, and when it draws a crowd, Peter starts preaching. And when Peter starts preaching, the authorities say, ah, oh, we don't like what you're saying, and they have them arrested. And then it says in 4.8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and he goes on and said, but wait, wasn't he already filled with the Holy Spirit? No, there are certain times the Holy Spirit comes on us in a powerful way and came on to Peter and probably helped Peter remember that scripture that he would point out as well when he talks to these to these folks when he talks to these people who are imprisoning them Jesus says this to the disciples in Luke 12 Jesus says when they bring you before the synagogues the rulers and the authorities do not worry about how you are to defend yourself or what you say. What? I mean, you're, you're, why not worry? But he says this, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. The Holy Spirit will be there. So if you're walking with God and then something happens, or you all of a sudden get into some sort of situation and you need to say something, don't worry, the Holy Spirit will be there. Or perhaps you've been talking to somebody in a deep conversation, you know, or a conversation about a deep topic. And you say something to them, and then all of a sudden you walk away thinking, boy, that was really good. I don't normally say things like that. I don't say things that well. But that was good because that was the Holy Spirit. Believe it or not, I look back sometimes at things I've written and, and I look sometimes and say, whoa, that was good. And you know what that means? Because it was good, I know it's not me. You know, it, 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 was, it, was, it was him. So the Holy Spirit comes upon us at certain times and fills us. But the Holy Spirit also fills us for specific purposes. So in Acts 2, what was the purpose? So that they could speak another language. Right? So they could speak another language, and because there are people there uh, at Pentecost from, pe from all over the place, and they could speak their own language. And the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples so they could speak another language. And I take it, that as soon as that incident was over, you're right, and all that, they could no longer speak that language. It was there and then it was gone. Right? Because that's how it, that's how it seems to work. In Acts 4, let me go to verse 31. So, so Peter has proclaimed and they let him they let Peter and John go they go back to the disciples and then we read this when they had prayed the place in which they were gathered together was shaken a sign of God's uh, God being pleased and they were all filled again we hear it again they were filled with the holy spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness so now they were filled so that kids could speak, but in their own language, I take it, but they're able to speak with boldness. Isn't that what we need? So I had a seminary professor. His name was Dr. Joseph Wong. He taught exegesis, and man, he was tough, but he was well-respected. And he told a story I've never forgotten 
because it just sort of blew my mind. He said one time, years before, he had been in, in Japan at a conference, a Christian conference. And they had had a Christian speaker from America or something like that like that speaking, and they needed a translator because very few, if any, of the Japanese spoke English, and they needed a translator. So they asked Dr. Wong to translate since they didn't have anyone else, and he says, I, I'm from Taiwan, not Japan. There's some similarity, but I, I don't think I can do it. But they had no other choice. So according to Dr. Wong, the speaker started speaking and he started translating fluently into Japanese. When the, when the, uh, the seminar was over, you know, and everything was settling down, the people from the audience were coming up to Dr. Wong and speaking to him in Japanese. Presumably he thought to thank them, but he had no idea because all of a sudden he couldn't understand anything they were saying. But isn't that what the Spirit does? The Spirit fills for His purpose in His time is what the Spirit does. Um, so, um, where does all this leave us? Well, it leaves us with the fact that here we are, and I, I want to point out to you what were, you know, when, the, when in Acts 4, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, what were the, what were the early Christians doing when they were filled with the Holy Spirit? First of all, I notice they're all together. They were all together. How important it is to gather together as a church and then it says they were also praying. How important it is to gather together as a church and pray. And that's why, and this is what um, very soon, not this week, maybe even next week, I want to invite you to come here to the church, if you're able, Tuesday afternoons at 5.30, just from 5.30 to 6, short time, that we'd pray for the church, that we'd pray for St. John's, that we'd pray for the world, whatever we need to pray for, and there's a lot. I'll be here. If it's just me, that's fine. If others want to join me, that'll be fine as well. Like I say, not this week, but perhaps the following week, and we'll let you know next week um, about that. So the Holy Spirit is with you. So take just a minute, and I'm going to take my Bible, because take just a minute, think about what the Holy Spirit would be speaking talking to you about. And then I'm going to close with the same prayer that the early church prayed.
Oh yes, Holy Spirit, come and fill your lambs, almighty and everlasting God. Grant to us, your servants, to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Yes, as we get ready to share in this sacred meal, we do have to pray one more time. Reason for this prayer is that we're not worthy for this meal. And we need to ask God to forgive us. Heavenly Father, indeed, we, we have not we have not always done what you want us to do. We've not said what you want us to say or we said things you didn't want us to say or we even have had thoughts that have not been pleasing to you. And we are sorry. Father God, forgive us through the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanse us that we may be forgiven and not just forgiven that we may be made worthy to share in the sacred meal and thank you father we are grateful indeed that you love us enough to make all this available to us Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. It was on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us that he took the bread. He gave thanks to you, Father. He broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body which has been given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to you, Father. He gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And by your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we share in his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all glory and honor 
is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Well, we'll be um, having communion today in the, in, in the pews. The ushers will come forward. And um, so as the uh, tray is passed, just take the piece of bread, just hold it until everybody has received, and we'll all take communion together. We'll do the same with the cup. Just hold the, the uh, cup of juice. We will all um, commune then together. And you're all welcome to commune. As long as you love the Lord Jesus Christ, that's all we ask. It's, you don't have to belong to the church or the Methodist church in order to, uh, in order to share in this meal that Jesus has given to us. So let us prepare our hearts to receive this sacred meal.
God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Please, you, please stand and join us as we sing of the goodness of God. God, you promised us in your goodness, you promised us you would not leave us here as orphans. So thank you. And come, Holy Spirit, fill us, strengthen us, empower us through the power within us so that we would know we can do immeasurably more, immeasurably more than all we can even ask or imagine through your power the power of the advocate in us. Praise be to God and all God's children said, Amen.